But one of the main things I wanted to start with are the gatherings that the brother that I'm with right now is a close companion of mine. What Eamon does, he comes to areas like this where alhamdulillah there's a lot of youths here. But then it's kind of sad that when he gets here, we'll get a couple of brothers that come and say, Akhi, I need to speak to you, I need to speak to you. I've been waiting for you to come for so long. I need to speak to you and they talk to him privately. And they address matters like they're alone, they're suffering from something alone, they're being bullied, or they're going through situations. And I find it very sad. Why does it take for someone like the brother here to come for him, to, for these ch children to think that now finally I've got someone to speak to? Mm. Where's the rest of the brothers? Mm. How are there brothers amongst your community where everyone, else, look how many brothers there are here. MashaAllah, the mesh is full. Look around you, you got brothers that, oh, unless you're racist, <laughs> brothers that you lot get, would get along with, brothers you play football with. I'm sure, unless any of, you, any of you lot are involved in any gang violence, you've got nothing against anyone in the masjid, especially when you don't know them. But you need to be there for your brothers. How can someone wait for somebody to come from London all the way to Portsmouth to feel like, yo, I've got, finally got someone to talk to? Be there for your brothers. You don't know what people are going through, you know. I don't mean to start off straight into the deep topic, but brothers, I know other nine-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds that have committed suicide because of the bullying and the harassment they've gone through. Mm. And on their suicide note, the first thing they write, I've had no one to turn to, no one to talk to. It's mad, you know. And we'll be held accountable. Every single person here Look, there's another situation we know in Wembley. A brother was being harassed by his brother-in-laws simply for marrying a sister that was of different ethnicity. So the, the brother-in-laws are going crazy. They found him on the streets. They batter him. The guy's walking around in a thobe and he's getting battered left, right, center. They beat him so bad and they rip off his clothing. I think he had to go home in his shorts. And little situations like that, yeah? Little situations like that could be resolved by literally if there's a good firm amount of brothers that go to the house and say, listen, let's resolve this, let's talk as men. Me and the brother Eamon here have done this before. We've gone to houses and resolved simple matters just by talking. It doesn't mean that everyone needs to get, get together and beat everyone up. <coughs> I've seen loads of Muslim brothers getting picked off one by one, small people, just because they're small, they look, they look innocent, get beaten up. But you're telling me right now, if everyone, even a group of 10 of you, stood together and showed solidarity and unity, that someone will pick on you. Even in Luton, man, they wait for people to break apart into little groups they know. They know, um, like, yo, this guy doesn't really have much friends. That person will get bullied and battered. It doesn't mean that you don't need to be best friends. It's just being there for brothers when they're needed and then going on your daily business. It's sad, man. The suicide rates, depression rates. I know about 14 year olds that are on antidepressants. That's sad, man. And us that will be held accountable. How can a brother right next to you be going through something? How often do you turn to, turn to your brothers right next to you and ask, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? Actually, how are you? You're right. There are brothers that just because they have a big smile on their face, you, you think they're all happy. And most of the time, I'll tell you something, brothers, yeah? Maybe there's a lot of young brothers here, so you may not know. As you get older, you will know. The people that smile the most, that laugh the loudest, are the ones that are going through the most. And they have this thing where they use other people and other situations as a distraction. Like, you know what? I'm around a lot of brothers. I'm going to laugh and joke and just forget what I'm going through. Actually, no, it shouldn't be like that. You should be able to speak to these people and say, Achi, it's chill, let's... We'll mess around later. What's going on? Everything okay? How's things at home? How's things in your life? Is there any situations you're going through? Or even then, even if you don't ask that, you need to be the kind of people where other brothers, or your, even your family members, it's sad nowadays, it's even bad with family members, that they should be able to turn to you and say, Akhi, I'm going through something, you know, I need someone to talk to. Maybe you can advise me. A lot of people don't really need you to do anything physically. They just need someone to talk to, you know. And a lot of the times, this is what causes a lot of people to become guided astray. May Allah protect us from that. And I'll tell you one thing. Everyone knows about heroes and villains, right? Heroes are good, villains are bad. Unless you guys live in a cave, <laughs> I think everyone knows the difference. 
But do you know what makes a hero become a hero compared to what makes a villain become a villain? Does anyone know? Oh, not a single guess. <laughs> Basically, it's the way they react to certain situations in their life. So a villain and a hero both grow, go through something traumatic in their life. If you know about superheroes, I'm sure everyone at this age knows about superheroes, yeah? They go through something crazy and traumatic where it changes them forever. But it's all about how you react to the problem. So a villain will go through trauma and pain and say, you know what, I had no one in my life to help me through it, you know? No one was there for me. So now I'm going to make sure everyone suffers the way I suffered. But a villain looks at a difference. They say, you know what, the way I felt alone, the way I felt pain, I want to make sure no one feels the way I felt, you know. I'm going to make sure I'm there for everybody so no one feels that amount of pain. And alhamdulillah, that's why I feel like Allah tests us, you know. Allah gives us hardships and burdens in our life to make us different people and have a better concept on what people are going through and have a better understanding of the world. And everyone has to go through this kind of pain, it's sad. There's a lot of things that, like I said, there's a lot of young brothers, you lot are gonna go through a lot, but you need to be patient, you know. Allah gives you these tests as a blessing, I'm telling you. You lot can save lives. You lot can make a difference. I know brothers that have, at 14, 15 year old, their, their best friends have died in their arms including myself. When I, was, when I was 14 years old, I had a brother, I'm not allowed to mention his name, family said oh, they don't want me to for their own reasons. 14 years old, again, I'm not focusing on making sure that everyone's okay. I'm not focusing on if he needed me. I had a distraction. Distractions are the most dangerous things. And for you guys, it's even worse. You guys are distracted every moment in your life, literally. You can't, you can't even go to the toilet without being on TikTok or Instagram or something. And I was distracted by, during my Jahiliya times, someone that I wish, shouldn't be going to see, I was going to see. Brother called me and said, yo, I need help. I'm about to go get into a little altercation. Obviously he didn't say altercation with road, no one says it like that. But he's like, yo, I'm about to get into a little bit of madness. I need a bit of help. Uh, what are you saying, where are you? I'm saying, bro, I'm about to go meet someone. What are you saying, can you handle this by yourself? Like, what are you saying, you look all right? He told me, yeah, you know what, yeah, go do your thing. It's all right. Uh, I'll deal with it, I'll pattern it. It's nothing. I said, no problem. Wallahi, I got called 25 minutes later, you know, from another friend that went with him. And the brother got stabbed in his neck. He died on the scene. That mashed me up, you know. T even till now, I, I feel a bit of blame to myself. Like, if I had been there, maybe I could have saved him. Maybe I would have been the one that died instead. It broke me. And ima imagine now there's someone beside you, you may not know him personally, but you know even just his name. And you know that person had no one and they killed themselves. Or they were killed because of a situation that they had no one to turn to. Actually, you, you will live with that, you know. You, you won't be able to forgive yourself. I'm telling you, I've seen other brothers, like I said, I feel like I could have been there for them. And it was, it was hard, man. <clears throat> and the maddest thing is, there's a, there's a flip side to this story. There's another thing where you can't save everyone at the same time. So you need to know your limits. After the situation that I went through, I felt like I needed to be there for everybody. Even in situations that I shouldn't have been involved in. So then anyone that would call me for help, whether it's moving houses, whether it's getting into fights or whatever, I felt like I needed to help everybody. Down to drug dealers that I knew that were my friends at the time, they would call me for help and I would get involved in their nonsense and then end up fighting other people that I shouldn't be fighting and then that's it, for the rest of my life I've got, I've got beef with people that I didn't even know before that day. And then, because of these certain situations, I've ended up in prison now. I've looked at, I was looking at 23 years for defending someone I shouldn't have and I'm looking at 23 years for a kidnap case that I swear to you, I did not even know who the guy was. So now I'm looking at 23 years, the guys that I'm calling for help that were involved in it, none, none of them want anything to do with me, you know. Again, that's, this, you need to be careful about the brothers you're around because no one cares about you unless they're practicing, I'm telling you. The jamaat that I have around me right now, I swear to you, we can call each other whenever, whatever, even if it's the smallest situation, 
I said, just stay on the phone. I need some counsel. And we're there for each other. But the brothers, that, the guys I had around me, not brothers, they weren't, most of them weren't even Muslim. Guys around, I had around me before, they put me in prison and I'm calling them for help and none of them were there for me, you know? None of them. The only person I probably had to speak with at the time was my wife and my mum. And even then I found it hard calling my mum because every time she spoke to me, I was just, she was just crying and it was just, it was just hurting me so much. But then you know what's sad? Being in these situations, things get harder if you don't learn your lesson, you know? While I'm in jail, I'm messing around more. I've got into selling phones and, and drugs in prison. Then it's like Allah's testing me now. It's like, now my nan's passed away while I was in jail. And my nan was like my mum at the time. I lived with this woman. She was the closest person to me in my life. Whenever I had any situations in my life, I used to run to my mum, my nan. Like I used to call her like my second mum. Now she's dying while I'm in jail. And because of the stupidness I was getting up with in jail, they said, I'm too high security. We can't let you out to go see her funeral. Normally you get to go to your direct family's funeral when you're in jail. You can come out for a day release. They said, no, you're not going nowhere. I remember the security governor begged him. I said, please, man, give me extra time for the nonsense. I've done anything. Just let me go to my nan's burial. The guy laughed in my face. He said, you, of all the people, you. No way, no way. And then at that moment, you'll realize a lot of brothers, I don't know if anyone's into any stupidness like drug dealing or anything like that. For situa in situations like that, even if you spend one couple of days in jail, Wallahi, I said, I will give up every penny I earned doing haram just to be out for my, my nan's funeral for one day. By Allah, Wallahi, I'll give it all up for one day just to be at my nan's burial, you know, just to see her face go. That even till now, I feel away. I can't even go to her house where my uncles and that live without shaking and feeling away like I can't believe it. This woman does so much for me and I wasn't there. <coughs> and and that, that, this all comes from the brothers that you hang around with. Again, like I said, I was around a bad crowd. Even when I was in jail, I wasn't around proper brothers. Later on, we sorted things out. When I came to my dean and uh, when I was inside, I, hang, I hung around brothers. And again, the company you keep is very, very important, you know. If you're around five wealthy brothers, you'll be the sixth. If you're around five boring guys, just do nothing and bums, I promise you, you'll be the sixth. If you're around five crackheads, yeah, the stuff that they do will be entertaining to you, you'll become the sixth. Wallahi, it's not a joke. Whatever your people around you are doing, it becomes normal. That's why now, right now, I travel a lot with a good practicing brothers, including Amen. Even just praying before wasn't normal because I was always around no Muslims. It was, it was a burden to tell them, yo, wait, wait for me, wait for me. Let me quickly pray and come. Then it became normal not praying. Now not praying is not accepted around the brothers. Now it's, yo, you know the little excuses everyone comes up with, yo, I need to shower, <laughs> you know, for X, Y, and Z reasons. <laughs> I can't pray. Uh, bro, bro, I'll, I'll see you lot later. I'm not clean. And you can only obviously assume what kind of stuff they're bringing up to. But then, and they'll get stuck on, you know? There's certain brothers that are around me, I'll, bro, I'm telling you, I've seen brothers get slapped up. Like, what do you mean you're not praying, bro? A little kick, water on your face, what do you mean? So alhamdulillah, these are the kind of brothers you need to be around. What, how, how long can I go? I don't even know. It's up to you. What do you mean? I don't know. I'm not sure how long I'm meant to be, so I'll quickly start finishing up with the hadith, yeah? There's a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he was around his companions. And I'm going to say to you what he said to the companions. Every single person here is going to Jannah. Every single one of you is going to Jannah. All the companions looked at each other smiling with joy. Of course, you're all going to paradise. It's, a, it's, a, it's knowing you're actually going to go into paradise, something you're accepting. It's an it's a overjoying feeling. Then he stopped and he said, except those of you who don't want to. The companions looked at each other and said, who wouldn't want to go to paradise? If I asked a single one of you this question, you want to go to paradise, everyone's going to say yes. But then your actions show otherwise. So when the companions said, who wouldn't want to go to, the, go to paradise? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded, those of you who choose not to listen and obey. Everybody knows what they're doing is wrong when they do it. It's not a joke. 
Everyone knows what they need to do before they leave the house to be able to pray. If everyone's confused, you have clear instructions in front of you. All you've got to do is pick up a Qur'an, everything right and wrong is in the book, you know. If, if you find it hard to look at the Qur'an, you have people you can turn to. But if you don't have people you can turn to, then you've doomed yourself. You know where to go, everyone knows where a masjid is. The brother says it a lot, I hope, I hope everyone's here in the masjid regularly and not just because a certain speaker's here. And they, they make it a habit of turning up. And like I said, if you turn up here enough, you'll end up noticing certain brothers that need your help, that need your company. Inshallah, Allah puts it in you that you, be, you become someone of value and someone that can help anyone else. And remember, no one here, a lot of people walk around like they're lone wolves. They feel like they're by themselves and they're happy that way. I don't need no one, I can walk around. But no, it's not true, bro. Don't, don't, don't be delusional. Everyone thinks being by themselves is the best thing. Wallahi, it's not. Find your band of brothers and go around and make a difference. Even if it's just being together and being there for each other. Bro, it's, I'll give you an example. One, one argument that I had with a brother that's here is a simple thing. Like for, for me, it's a big thing. If, if, family, if a family member or a friend of mine has to call a cab to go to the airport, it's like, what the hell? I've got cars, I've got free time. Why, why wasn't I someone that you could have called for that little small gesture? You've had to call and pay for a cab. Why am I not there for you? Why, why do you feel like I'm not there for you? That's a big thing. You've got to question yourself, you know, that they feel like they can't rely on you. He want, you, you, get, you get mothers going in cars with men by themselves or sisters going in cars, in cabs with men by themselves because they've got no one in their family. On the way here, just down the road, on the way here, just down the road, I see an elderly woman barely can stand straight, carrying mad heavy bags by herself. Where's her family? Where are the brothers that she can turn to? Why is it hard for people like this to talk to people and feel like I need help? Help me take the shopping home. Anyways, brothers, I'm gonna finish up with this. Just please, Achis, brothers, yeah? Look around, know that there are people out there that need your help. Allah makes you go through certain things to teach you that there are other people that need the experience that you've gone through so you can warn each other about what will happen if they carry on living the lives that you live. So now I come up to Allah. But this thing is leaning too much, brother. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Better than that, better than that. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I want to start off by saying all praise be to Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, the most powerful. It's only Him we worship, only Him we bow down to, and only Him we turn to when we're in need. Also, I'd like to send peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear respected brothers and sisters, Jazakallah wa khairan for coming down. Um, I appreciate the masjid for inviting us and giving us this great opportunity to sit in front of you. Wallahi, uh, guidance only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, not from me, not from the brother Abu Sufyan, nor from the Imam. Guidance only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so bear that in mind. Sometimes people place, uh, stuff like, sometimes Allah places people into your life in order for you to learn from, in order for you to learn from their footsteps, their wisdom, their knowledge, and so on and so forth. And just remember that. And understand this, that sometimes you may be going through the worst of times, just understand that there's only one way to go. Fafirru ilallah. Flee to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Flee to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We had an event yesterday, it was actually called Flee to Allah. And one of the things that we actually neglect, as the brother Abu Sufyan mentioned, is, is the fact that there's so many of us going through mental health. Uh, before I carry on, how many people are Kurdish in here? Okay, Allahumma barak. You're going to get grilled in the Kurdish language. Um, um, 
Alhamdulillah, as I was mentioning, yeah, there's so many of us that come to the masjid and wallah al azim we go through some sort of mental health. There's trials and tribulations of every single person that's going through it. We're all going through it. The, the difference between uh, the trials and tribulations is depending on how you implement it or how you deal with it or how you um, move forward from it. And this is something that I've always wanted to say as well, yeah? Is that wallah al azim no one could live your life better than yourself. Remember that, no one can live your life better than yourself. Every single person, one of the reasons why we live in misery and depression and anxiety and we, and we suffer from PTSD because we try to compare our lives with those that are, you know, those that don't have the life that's been allocated to us. Example is the people on social media. We compare to what we have to what they have. And one of the things that is killing the Muslim Ummah, the younger generation, is this. You're comparing it. And this is where we're going wrong. So understand my dear respected brothers and sisters, especially the youngsters here today, bro. You're the next generation. It's time for you to uprise, bro. It's time for you to uprise in a manner that has never ever happened before. The biggest, and one of the biggest viruses of our time, I'm not talking about COVID-19, my brothers, is the virus of social media. Social media will be used, you know, for you or against you. Let's be real. There's certain things that we get up to behind closed doors. Bro, you know what I'm talking about. It's very easy access to whatever filth that we youngsters are getting up to. Correct? Brothers are nodding their head like, yeah, man. But it's right. The filth that we get up to behind closed doors is one of the reasons why the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is suffering. He described us as one body. One body. If there was a pain that we feel in one part of our body, the whole body is going to feel it. Your misery is my misery. Your happiness is our happiness. Your anger, your depression is our depression. And so on and so forth. As the man said, Wallah al-Adim. So I'm going to make this quick, quickly, inshallah, yeah? I want you to salam the brother next to you, behind you, in front of you. Salam him right now, bro. Some of you have come to this match, you haven't even salamed each other. Get to know each other. This is Islam. Huh? This is the reality. Salaamu Alaikum Habibi. Some Bluetooth salam from here, mashallah. <laughs> this is the na'ma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the things that I'm going to mention, as Abu Sufyan mentioned, some of us are suffering from depression, bro. But this is a battle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allocated to you. Not to me. Not to the Imam. Not to Abu Sufyan. Not to the brothers that I came with or the brothers that I've met for the first time has allocated to you, bro. And no one could pass these trials and tribulations apart from you. There's certain things you're going through. Akhi, I can't. I, I wouldn't be able to handle it, like hack it or handle it. Certain trials and tribulations I go through, you wouldn't be able to hack it. But Allah has allocated to you. So therefore, just understand this: the moment. You give up on sabr, on patience. It's the moment that door was waiting for it to be opened. What well, you need to understand, my dear respected brothers and sisters, yeah, that when one door shuts, many doors open. There isn't one door shuts, another door opens. No, this is not how it works Islamically. When one door shuts, another door opens and so on and so forth. There's so many other examples. Brothers are saying, but Akhi, what if that back door is closed? Akhi, you got the windows, bro, use your head. You got the attic, you might as well go higher. And Subhan al-Malik, and this is what the brother mentioned, there was a man that was going through divorce, had a problem with his business, had a problem with his community, had a problem with his finan financial, but not just the business, but financially he was going bankrupt, but he never informed his family. He was on his way to commit suicide, bro. A family man. On his way to commit suicide. The same, there was another brother. 
across the road from him. He himself was having a bad day, but it's not as bad as him. This brother decided to cross the road just to go and send salam to the brother across the road. He crossed the road, says, said salam alaikum, bear in mind, the brother across the road was actually on his way to go and commit suicide. The moment the brother gave the salam, the one that was on his way to go and commit suicide, he said, Wallahi, in that moment, I, I, I realized that this is me. I am a Muslim. And these thoughts from the shaitan are nothing like what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with. So the moment he salamed me, I realized that I am a human being. I go through trials, I go through tribulations. He started comparing his life to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And no one suffered more than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this nation. Every Prophet that came before him had their own trials and tribulations. But the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is someone that we should be grateful for. He was allocated to this ummah. We wasn't at the ummah of Jesus alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam. Nor was we at the ummah of Musa alayhi salam. Nor was we at the ummah of Adam alayhi salam. The first creation that came. At the end of the day, every single prophet, every single messenger had. And guess what? The biggest ummah that will stand behind their prophet is the ummah of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There were some prophets that, were, that, that will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will have no one behind them. No one behind them. They were there for hundreds of years trying to guide people and not one person was guided. Does that mean that that prophet and messenger failed? Of course not. But they played their part. That was their test. And wallahi, remember this, no matter what you're going through, no matter how much you think you're away from the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the companions radiallahu anhu understand this that there was a conversation that Musa alayhi salam had with Allah he said, Ya Allah you made the angels prostrate to Adam alayhi salam Ya Allah you made everyone acknowledge who Adam alayhi salam was you gave him a status, you gave him Jannah what is there or what is enough for Adam alayhi salam to say? So I'm paraphrasing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise be to God, to Allah. It was enough for him that no matter what he done, no matter what the angels done, that was enough for him to say, Alhamdulillah. When was the last time you said Alhamdulillah, bro? Alhamdulillah bro, for being awake. Alhamdulillah for walking. Alhamdulillah for having eyes to see. Alhamdulillah for having a loving and caring and, 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 and passionate family that they have for you. Family that are caring, bro. Your mothers and your fathers went through that struggle of working. But yet they made sure that you had everything under the sun. This is our parents. There was a Kurdish, and the reason, alhamdulillah, I'm mentioning this here, I'm from South East London. There was a Kurdish boy that came to me, and I mentioned this just in the talk that we had a few hours ago. There was a Kurdish boy that came to me by the age of 14 years old. He came to me crying. And I hugged him, I said to him, bro, what's up, man? I feel all right. He said to me, I don't know what to do. I said, go on, akhi. He said to me, my mother and my father are Kurdish. He said to me, they do not allow me to pray inside my household. And I'm Kurdish myself, bro. So hearing all of this, and I said this to the Jama'a before, you see, it's very hard to find practicing Kurdish people. But Allahumma barik, when you find them, they, you feel ashamed because the way they so good in their ibadah and they're, and, they're, and they're taking responsibilities in their trials and tribulations that come their way. And wallahi, I know many Kurdish people that come to this country, akhi. They were practicing back in Iraq, but they come to this country, akhi, through a truck, through the boat, wherever it may be, akhi. That man, they are sneaking through the UK. 
They get to the UK and they forget the deen of Allah completely. They work in car washes. I've seen it, bro, because I worked with the car wash, bro. Years ago, I worked in the car wash. Not, not like that, but I was helping my friend's business. So I was managing the place. And there were so many Kurdish people that came into the car wash. And every single one of them wasn't praying. And I asked them, was you praying back in Kurdistan? I said, yeah. So what makes you think that Allah brings you to the UK? That you neglect him with Salah? How can you neglect Salah? And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what does he state? The difference between us and the Kuffars are what? It's Salah. And I'm not here to call you a Kafir, bro. But you leave Salah as clear cut. I'm not a scholar. I'm not an imam. But I'm going to tell you, you leave Salah, Akhi. You better mind. Akhi, you might as well go in the pub. You might as well commit every sin under the sun. If you leave your Salah. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels to prostrate to Adam alayhi salam, what happened? Iblis alayhi was about to say alayhi salam, tiff alayk. Yeah? Yeah? Iblis, na'latullah alayhi. Yeah? Iblis refused. Iblis refused. Why did he refuse? And do you know why he refused? Because Iblis was the biggest racist. And some of us has racism traits within us, bro. So you are like Iblis. Because Iblis said, I am made from fire. I am not prostrating to the one that you created that's made out of clay. So he refused. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Iblis, Shaitan, you will be in Jahannam for eternity. And then Iblis came back and said, Ya Allah, I will misguide the Ummah, the Muslims, until Yawm Qiyamah. And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, stated, as long as my servant comes back and repents. So if you're committing zina, Allah is waiting for you. You're smoking, Allah is waiting for you, akhi. You're trapping, Allah is waiting for you, akhi. And I'm going to be honest with you right now, bro. If you had the intentions of coming to this talk or coming to the masjid for seeing me like a waste man that's sitting in front of you, akhi, the door's over there. Rectify your intentions. You come to the masjid because we want the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to prosper. While every single prophet turns their back on you in your maqiyamah, it is only going to be the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And my dear respected brothers and sisters, yeah? Please, when I mention the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Show your respect to him by saying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam This is the least we could do as Muslims Every single time you hear his um, You hear his name being mentioned And Wallahi, for the sisters in the background And you have the children that are making noises I love that you don't need to tell them to shish. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and allow them to be someone that can benefit the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Because the masjid is not just here to pray. The masjid is your comfort. You see, back in my day, the block was the masjid, bro. We get into problems, we come back to the masjid, bro. Wallahi, we got gal problem, masjid. Mandan problem, masjid. Enemy problems, we come to the masjid, bro. Because the comfort you find in the masjid is the comfort you don't find at home, Akhi. And me and you both know what I mean. We went to a talk, when was it? F Thursday. Thursday. With all due respect. I don't even know if I should mention it. But there's people suffering at home, Akhi. Because of the filthiness that their family's putting them through. And they don't have the audacity or the guts to talk to anyone else. And you don't know what I'm talking about. And they come to the masjid sitting down in the corner, miserable, miskeen. Then you've got brothers come here to the masjid and salam and only the people you know. When that brother that's sitting down in the corner, it could be someone that's ready to commit suicide. How old was he, Akhi? Nine years old. Nine years old, Akhi. My man's talking about suicide. And he's from my country. <sighs> Habibi, the microphone is a bit too heavy, Akhi.
يا مسين ما شاء الله تبارك الله الحمد لله أخي عدونا وهي تواشب الله سبحانه وتعالى Your heart was not made for anybody to be in it. Your heart and every beat he beats is made for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not for your mother, not for your father, not for your siblings or your, the remaining of your family members. Your heart was made for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the more we give pieces of our hearts to other people, the more it gets broken. And the moment it gets shattered, there's no repair. It's either you will be misguided because you neglected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or what do you do? Like Yusuf alayhi salam. What happened to Yusuf alayhi salam? He got betrayed by his own brothers. And they lied to their father saying that he got ate by a wolf. And then they threw him into the well. And then a caravan came. And they took him out of the well. And then they sold him as a slave. And after selling him to the slave, he was imprisoned for seven years. And after being imprisoned for seven years, he became a man that had the whole of Egypt and the surrounding areas in his hand. He was under the kin at the time. Look at the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to prosper because of what? Sabrun jameel. Because of a beautiful patience. I get it, bro. The rose has done something in my head, akhi. I'm traumatized. Wallahi, I am. Times I wild out. I used to wild out on my parents. I used to wild out on my wife. I used to wild out on the kids and the mandem and my brothers around me. Do you know why? Because, because pain doesn't change people, by the way, yeah? It's not pain that changes people. It's what you do to avoid the pain is what changes people. You do everything and anything you can in order for you not to be faced to face with the pain itself. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say to your souls, man. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِي O oh my servants. O oh my servants. Yeah? Those that have transgressed against yourselves. How will you transgress against yourself, bro? You picked your desires over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's the desires of talking to Gal. So talking to man, not talking about the men by the way, yeah? Talking for the sisters, talking to man, yeah? The desires of doing what? Smoking, drinking alcohol. I've seen brothers have the audacity to go out on their birthdays, and we don't celebrate birthdays, akhi. The most I say to someone on their birthday, Alhamdulillah, another year, another blessing. Another year closer to death. But what are you gonna do with it, bro? Because you just go one step ahead. Sorry, one step forward to death. Man have the audacity to go out with a gal, have alcohol on their table, and ask the waiter, yo, is the food halal, yeah? <laughs> food, food halal, yeah? A certificate, yeah? You can't pick and choose, bro. But that's his trials and tribulations. And there was a time, and I'm gonna mention this as well, yeah? There was a time I went in a shisha bar, in my fob. Yeah? Akhi was around one o'clock. I had to go into a shisha bar, akhi. Everywhere was closed. I needed to go in there to change my bag, because I got a bag on my stomach. The brothers are telling me, Akhi, Akhi, Ayman's about to get cancelled. Alhamdulillah. I said to him, Akhi, give me one of these scarves, yeah? I wrapped up my head, everything. Man walked in there. Yeah? I walked in there with a phobe on, I had the security in front of me, the security behind me. I didn't even want to let them know what color skin I was, so I've tucked in my everything, everything. Walked in, I'm looking around, I see so many sisters and brothers in the shisha bar, smoking, listening to music, free mixing, kissing, kissing. 
Wallahi, a part of me became so prideful and arrogant, I started judging them. So look at these scumbags. Look at them. Look at the way they're doing. Look, look at what they're doing with their lives. And Subhan al Malik, when I came out of the toilet, Subhan al Malik, as soon as I got outside, Akhi, it hit me. And what hit me, Akhi, is that Subhanallah, how can I judge these people? Because the very next day, the very next day, some of those people were in my talk. And I saw them in the crowd. I saw the brothers in the crowd. And I mentioned it in there. And I said to them, Walhamdulillah, that was their trials and tribulations, Akhi. I was so quick to judge them, and I was so quick to point fingers at them, but yet the very next day they came to my talk. But maybe in that one night, they repented to Allah subhanahu wa malik They repented to Him. And understand this, my dear respected brothers and sisters, yeah? Allah don't need your ibadah. Allah don't need your zakat. Allah don't need your salah. Allah doesn't need your kindness and your good character. Allah doesn't need you to praise Him. We feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs our praise. Allah needs our five daily prayers in order for him to be praised. Allah doesn't need you, bro. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions if there was a nation that was there that didn't commit any sin, Allah would send angels to destroy this nation in order for him to create a nation that sins or repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In order for them to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So understand this bro. No matter how much sins you're going through. Do not let the shaitan urinate in your ear bro. To tell you that wallahi. I'll give up on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give up on the mercy of Allah. And for the Kurdish brothers bro. You need to start practicing. I come from where you, exactly where you might come from bro. I was brought up in Mosul. We were attacked left, right and centre. ISIS on one side. Yeah? The Shias on another side. The Iranians on one side. The British, the, 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 the US army on one side. They were all getting attacked. And it was the last city to fall in Iraq. And how many of my family members have returned back to Allah? But they stood firm. They were steadfast. And they left. They left everything they had to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of, us, some of them returned back to Allah. And there was a story I remember during Ramadan about four years ago. Five years ago, astaghfirullah. Yeah. Allahu Akbar. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> May Allah bless you. There was a five years ago during Ramadan. Um, my cousin was in the house. And through the direction where Mosul is here, through the direction where the bonfire was coming from, you could tell who's attacking you. So... There was a bomb that landed all on, on, on the house of my cousin and it killed her and five of her kids. It killed her and five of her kids. Her husband came back to the house and her husband saw bits of my cousin and the kids all over the place. And her husband became majnoon. He lost his aql, he lost his mind. But what happens to people here, bro? We see some people that are addicts. We see some people that are in the streets going mad and jumping up and down and they're talking to themselves. But actually, that person that we make a mockery out of is a person that's gone through trials and tribulations, bro. But when that person doesn't have Iman, when that person doesn't have Quran, was Sunnah, and following the companions, radiallahu anhum, what does he do? He returns to the likes of drugs and alcohol because there's no Islam within him. Sometimes I fall into that man. And there was a time I remember after my mother, after my mother passed away, because the brother here, Abu Sufyan, was with my mother in Mecca when she passed away. He was with her in Mecca. And I only met him after this. But there was a time Abu Sufyan was telling me, Akhi, you need some time to yourself. I was so distracted, so distracted. Mentally, I was finished. I cried at night, during the day, I'm smiling in people's faces like I'm not going through nothing. But he kept on calling me. And a true brotherhood is not someone that waits for you to open your mouth. 
A true brotherhood senses it in his heart. I censor my brother not going through something. So let me make that phone call. And Abu Sufyan said to me, Akhi, go ahead. He was saying this every single day, day upon day, day upon day. And wallahi, I came to a situation. I came to a situation where I ended up getting stuck in a ditch. Somehow it was so raining. I was going through some fields. My car went straight into a ditch. I'm trying to reverse, I'm trying to get out. Actually, nothing is happening. And I said, Alhamdulillah. I was being distracted so much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala slowed me down. So for that whole three hours that I was in that ditch, all I did was cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All I did is ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I shouldn't be asking like this. Why did you take my mother away so early? At the age of 56 years old. You see, we, we, we. We don't know what we have until it's gone, as the British people say. We don't know what we have till it's gone. And in that moment, I remember, and I kept on playing her voice note over and over and over again. And for the Kurdish brothers that I know, my mother sent me a voice note saying, Tawid, 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 come. And then she continued to say to me, Amen, what size fold do you wear in order for me to bring one back for you? And then she said to me to forgive me, Ya Amen. This was the night before. Forgive me, Ya Amen. And then in that moment, she knew she was going to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something I'm going to say to the Kurdish brothers, to the Asian brothers, to the Arab brothers, to the African brothers. Bro, fix up. Bro, fix up, bro. Your parents are waiting for you, Ak. Stop using your friends over your parents, Akhi. Stop trying to be on the block and trying to be those men that was that life that wasn't allocated for you, bro. You're trying to follow the footsteps of a trapper, of a musician. Actually, a lot of men around me are musicians. But I don't want to be going down that path. But I still love and respect them because they are my brothers in Islam. I may not support them in music, but I support them in their brother in faith, Akhi. Brother in faith. And I'm going to say this to you, bro. What was the, Akhi, let's be real with ourselves, Akhi. If your Salah has rust on it, and if your Quran has dust on it, Akhi, you have failed as a Muslim. Because it's not just through Ramadan where we turn to the Quran, Akhi. Read one ayah. Look at the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as my companion, I would always choose Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr, he would always choose him. Because he was his friend before he came with the message of Islam. Yeah? So when, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with the message, came with the message, Abu Bakr accepted it. And when it came to giving sadaqah, Abu Bakr gave every single penny that he had compared to Umar ibn Khattab, where he gave half of his wealth. Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, till today, bro, over 1400 years ago, when you go to Umrah, ask about his charity. Till today, till today, he still builds a legacy, bro. What's your legacy in London? What's your legacy in Portsmouth or, or Southampton? What legacy have you built for yourselves, for your family? But yet Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, too, today he's got a charity in his name, Ak. This is men. This is men that sacrificed everything for you. And there was a time that people, by the people of Ali, Ali, Ali ibn Talib, what did they say, bro? They said to him, hold on, Ali. They said to him, how comes at the time of Umar, the golden ages, how comes at the time of them, they had it easy, but during our time, we have it hard. <coughs> Ali radiallahu anhu replied 
because at the time of Abu Bakr wa Umar, they had men like me. And in my time, I have men like you that like to question, that like to question stuff. Where's your sincerity? Where's your love for one another? By Allah, sometimes I could see it on people's faces, bro. I could see, and this is not something oh, I see the unseen, nah. I can just look at someone and say, I can know that this man is a zani. I know just by looking at him, there's no noor on his face. Someone's like, ah, oh, bro, you can't, you don't see noor. Well, you can see the darkness on his face when you're committing zina. You can see the bags in these eyes if he's a trapper. I could see it, maybe because I've been around trappers. I've been around men that do uh, zina and so on and so forth. Maybe that's how I'm picking it up. But I'm seeing it. And you come, Akhi, you claim you want good for your brother. Uqsumu billah, you lot are a kathab. I'm a kathab, Akhi. I'm a liar. Because none of you is a true believer until you love for your brother or you love for yourself. That brother or sister that's sitting next to you, the car that you want for yourself, you must want it for your brother. The mansion, the clothes, the trainers, the phone, the watch. Man didn't want to take it on to me because I got a gift of a Rolex. I don't even wear watches, Akhi. Akhi, my phone tells me the time. Alhamdulillah. But they gave, me, they gave it to me as a gift. And brothers have the audacity to, instead of saying Allahumma barik, and this is the disease of our ummah, they decided to say, look at this man, profiting from the ummah. And people are defending me and say, yo, 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 relax, don't defend me, bro. I want their good deeds. Because I was so sick and twisted back in my day, I need their good deeds in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want them to be bankrupt in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is what it's come down to. Brothers refuting other brothers. Brothers making lies and slander against other brothers. And it happens in our communities, bro. If you don't follow the Quran, and you don't follow the Sunnah, and you don't follow the companions, radiallahu anhu wa tabi'een, akhi, best believe you will live a life of misery. The masjid we went to before masjid Abu Bakr, there was a few group of uh, Shia boys, yeah? They said, they contacted me saying, Akhi, I don't know if I should come because this is a, a Shia mosque by the name of Abu Bakr and we don't even like Abu Bakr. I said to them, Akhi, fear Allah and come into the masjid because this masjid is welcoming to anybody. Then we started to, you know, talking and so on and so forth, Akhi. You never know. This Shia, Alawi, Yazidi, whoever it may be, Akhi, could turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the character that you show. Because of the etiquette and manners that you show. Because let me tell you something, brothers, yeah? We follow the Salaf, right? Yeah? Yeah? Yes. Ra, you must sleep in, bro. We follow the companions, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Alhamdulillah. But some people have an issue with me by saying I don't call myself a Salafi. One of the reasons why I don't call myself Salafi is because I haven't followed every single action of the Salaf. So I feel like a scumbag, like a waste man, like the dirt beneath their feet for me to even be called that. And this is me, but we need to follow the Salaf. We need to follow the companions, radiallahu anhu. And I always say I follow the Quran, the Sunnah upon the understanding of the companions. And one of the things is, yeah, akhi, every single person had this different sect, different this, different that. Akhi, understand this, that when you're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you think that all of this worship and all of these things and all of this refutation that you're doing against the people of Bid'ah and so on and so forth, Akhi, that's not going to be counted in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only thing that's going to allow you to go into Jannah is what? Shout out, bro. Allah's mercy, Allah's rahmah. You know about the man that worshipped Allah for 500 years. He came to Allah. Allah ordered him to go into Jannah through his mercy. Then he tried to argue with Allah. He tried to argue with Allah. He said, Ya Allah, I worshipped you for 500 years. In other words, how dare you allow me? And how dare you have the audacity to allow me to go into Jannah through your mercy when I worshipped you for 500 years? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the angels to bring the mizan, the scales here. 
And he said, put 500 years of worship on one side and just the mercy of being able to see with one eye, he outweighed 500 years of worship. Because of his ungratefulness, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? He ordered him to go into Jahannam. And in that moment, say, Ya Allah, forgive me, Samihni, Samihni. Let me go into Jannah through your mercy. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to go into Jannah. And this is the Rahmah of Allah. Let me tell you something, my dear respected brothers and sisters, yeah? No matter how much you're going for, and I put a lot of emphasis on this, and I'm going to repeat this over and over again, Akhi. Return back to Allah, bro. For every thousand steps that you've taken away from Allah, it takes one step to, take, to turn back to Him. You've committed zina, come back to Allah. You've hurt your family, come back to Allah. You've hurt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and some of us, we do hurt the... The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam How? Because of our actions Our actions goes against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Our actions are not from his sunnah Nor from the companions And I'm not here to be a scholar I'm not here to sit down in front of you And tell you that I'm an alim Or an imam But I'm here to tell you my dear respected brothers and sisters Subhanallah, forgive me, bro. I'm getting dizzy. I'm going Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah Allahumma alaikum salam Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah Astaghfirullah And wallahi my dear respected brothers and sisters yeah, There's not much I want to go on to say I'm not here trying to You know Make your legs have pins and needles Hayaq Allah This paracetamol is for any feelings that I've hurt Please come forward and get some paracetamol Jazakallah khair and habib um, But wallahi al-azim I'm not here to sit in front of you And tell you that I'm better than you bro this folk don't mean nothing. This beard don't mean nothing, akhi. Do you understand? If my actions are not upon what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught, then understand this, akhi. These doesn't mean nothing to me. And I'm gonna say this again and over and over again, akhi. Be respectful to your parents, bro. And for the youngsters that are here, put your hands up if you still have a mother and a father, bro. Akhi, put your hands up with pride, bro. Pride, akhi. Understand that some of us are in the Wallahi, we're suffering with our parents, bro. And one of the reasons why I don't talk about my father is because, Akhi, my mother did everything for us. No disrespect to my dad, Akhi. But I never had a relationship with my father the way you men have. My father's paralyzed, Akhi. So I can't go to the park with him. He got tortured and kidnapped in Iraq. So this is one of the reasons why we came to the UK. But I've never been to the park with him where I've kicked a ball with him. Or gone shopping with him. As the brother Abu Sufyan said, he saw an old lady walking past and there's family members around her. And everybody neglected him. Or stuff like her. And also the fathers, everybody neglects him as well. But we're not ashamed. Uqsumu billah al We're not ashamed to go above and beyond for the parents of our companion but not our parents because we find it embarrassing and this is what's happening but my mother as much as I hate it my mother returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I'm content Allahumma ameen I'm content I said Luke is here you know I you should have uh, got me some kick out I had a break it would have been better may Allah bless you but 
My mother returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kullu man alayha fan. Everything will come to an end. Everything will come to an end. Even the angel of death will have to take his own life. Imagine that, bro. But there was a conversation between Jibreel alayhi salam and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Jibreel was talking to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Then suddenly the sky split open. The sky split open. The angel came down. I think it's the angel Israfil. Uh, correct me on this, Sheikh, yeah? Uh, angel Israfil, I believe. Yeah? Yeah? Israfil, he came down. I, I'm going to continue the story and I think you would know which angel it was, yeah? The angel came down. And um, when the angel came down, Akhi, Jibreel alayhi salam made himself small. Out of fear. And then when the angel came down, he gave the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam two options. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I've come here to give you two options. I would, you would either live like the kins of kin. Listen to this carefully, bro. Because these are who we are trying to be, bro. The angel was unnamed. Was it unnamed? Jazakallah khair, Habib. Perfect. Um, the angel, Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. You see, this is why we need the Imams around us. Allahumma barak. The angel came down and he had the, and gave the two options to, uh, um, uh, to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he gave him one option. You either live the kins of kin. You would give, you, you would get the fruits of this dunya. Mansions are made out of gold if you want. Or you will remain to live like, the, like a humble servant. How did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam choose to live? Huh? Akhi loud bro, huh? So why are we trying to live like rich, bro? Why are we trying to chase this dunya if our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose not to live that lifestyle? Akhi, this is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He chose to avoid it. And the poor people are the first ones to enter Jannah. Imagine that. So he chose to live like a humble servant. And you've got the man them here today, such as myself, Akhi. We're trying to chase the cryptocurrency. We're trying to chase the, 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 the bando, the trappers, the musicians. We're trying to chase these men. Akhi, one man's, Allahumma barak, Akhi, my man's working three jobs, completely neglecting his wife and kids. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, Akhi. What are you doing, Ak? Another person, yeah, uh, what was it, yesterday on my way to an event with my wife, Akhi, I get a phone call from my brother, on the phone with my brother, my wife is listening, Akhi, yeah? The man says to me, bro, I have a brother, he's got a wife and a child, yeah, he's got a wife and a child, he has a house that he's purchased, <coughs> listen to this, he has a house that he's purchased and he's renting it out. But that brother decides to live under the roof of my mother and my father and he doesn't even pay a penny. Even when my parents are struggling with the bills, my man doesn't pay a penny. A penny, bro. And when the father wants to talk to him, he's too scared, Akhi. He's too scared. Is this what it's become? Where our parents are scared to speak to us. Because now all of a sudden we think we're men. Brothers from this community are fighting their parents, bro. The brother got himself a girlfriend. Now he's trapping all the money he's making from this community. And I'm going to go see his family after. You're probably here. And you have the audacity to throw it back in your parents' face. But I'm going to break your jaw, bro. You waste, man. I'm going to say it to your face, Ak. Is this the life of a Muslim, bro? Where you go against your parents. Your mother that carried you for nine months and you picked a dusty kafir over your mother. But this is what it's become, bro. Astaghfirullah al-Azim. And we complain. The ulama are not doing enough. The imam of our, of our masjid is not doing enough. The Muslim leaders are not doing enough. What the hell have you done for the Muslim Ummah, bro? What have you done for the Muslim Ummah, Ak? What impact have you made for the Muslim Ummah, bro? What benefit have you brought in, bro? Ask yourself, Akhi. You are half of the Quran, Akhi, go and teach it. 
As the hadith mentions, the, the best of you are those that memorize the Quran and teach it. We got brothers here that half is of the Quran that are shy to give it. How can you teach, bro? I want to be in your position. We just got a phone call earlier before coming or the text message. One of the brothers that we went to um, saw out a murder case, Subhan al Malik. Tomorrow is his janazah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shower him with his mercy. Allahumma ameen. 16 years old, akhi. And do you know who killed him? His own friend killed him. They were friends growing up. They used to go and see each other's mothers and go into each other's homes. And then they got into a little issue, so they separated. And they got into arguments. But they never wanted to come across each other. The brother got phoned. Akhi, there's a problem, come to the park. He turned up to the park in the aid of his brother. In the aid of his brother, bro. And what does the hadith mention? For the one that comes to the aid of his brother, it is better, as the Prophet Muhammad said, it is better for him to do itikaf in my masjid. So he decided to come in the aid of his brother. He chilled there. A few minutes later, his old friend, the one that shared the same plate with in their parents' house on each, because they were friends, Akhi. Had a bali on, had a hoodie on, jumped off the bike, Akhi, and poked him straight in the chest. The moment he stabbed him, he stabbed him here. I believe he was here, Wallahu alam. Yeah. He punctured his lungs and his heart at the same time. Sorry, Akhi. He punctured his lung and his heart at the same time. And on the spot he dies. And his friends around him were telling him, Yo, bro, say your shahada ak. Say your shahada ak. And they, the, akhi, the day before, akhi, the day before I saw him at my talk, sitting in the front row, and we took pictures together. The day before, 16 years old. Is this what it's come to, Akhi? Muslims are killing each other. Old friends become enemies. But alhamdulillah, the last conversation I had with him, yeah? The last conversation I remember having with him in the masjid while we took pictures, yeah? Was that alhamdulillah, I'm starting to pray my five daily prayers. Alhamdulillah, I've become more obedient to my parents. You see how Allah tested him straight away. Allah tested him straight away. And now the brother's dead. And tomorrow is his janazah. How are we meant to move forward, bro? When brothers are killing each other. How was the Ummah meant to move forward, Ak? If every single one of us is only thinking about ourselves. This is not Yawm Qiyamah where you think nafsi, nafsi, Ak, where you're only thinking about, you're only concerned with yourself, Ak. Yawm Qiyamah hasn't come. Well, you're moving like this now. You're moving like this now. Imagine in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But naked, uncircumcised, Ak. Imagine. How am I meant to look at the family tomorrow? One of the brothers that was with him is here with me today. And when he was saying his shahada and the brother was going away, the brother said, yeah, he held on to his ankle and said, don't leave me, don't leave me. For a 15 year old to witness his friend die right in front of him. Is this fair? Another brother in MK, in Milton Keys, Akhi came to my talk. He came to my talk, Akhi. He said to me, Yeah, Amen, from today onwards, I would never ever sell any more drugs. I would never ever go and commit zina. I would never ever hurt someone else. And do you know what happened to him, Akhi? 12 hours later, he gets stabbed up. And I said to him, Akhi, you are a blessed man. Because you said you're going to change and Allah tested you straight away. 
Some people claim they're going to change and Allah leaves them for years. Allah leaves them for years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, you say that you believe and you, feel and you, you, you think you're not going to be tested. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was tested, he had to bury six of his kids. When he was born, he didn't even have a relationship with his father. He didn't even see his father. Yeah? And on top of that, On top of that, he only witnessed six years with his mother. And the first tear he ever had was his mother passed away right in front of him. How are you going to feel when the Malik al Mode comes and knocks on your door, Ak? Because the money, the fame, the status that you have in this world, the angel of death is not going to care. And the most miserable people in this dunya are those that are what? The riches of rich. The celebrities in the Hollywood. Shout out to Bollywood too. And Nollywood as well. Because all of them akhi, that have this status, have this money, have this fame. What are they doing, Ak? They're turning to drugs and addiction and they're overdosing. And they're returning back to Allah in a shameful manner. But ask yourselves this, for us, and the Prophet Muhammad states this, yeah? Giving sadaqah doesn't decrease your wealth. Wallah al adim for every trial and tribulations I go through, I'm not here to expose my good deeds, but this is a lesson to you, bro. For every single trial and tribulations that I went through, akhi, I gave in charity, I gave in charity, I gave in charity. Akhi, even if it's a pound. The brother's going for a case. 26 years he's looking at Akhi giving charity. You're looking at life in jail, Akhi giving charity. A man, that, a man that I met in jail, he's still in jail. He's done 19 years in jail, Akhi. He was the biggest kafir, bro. A drug dealer, alcoholic, an addict, a addict, everything. Yeah? Akhi, he went, before he went to jail, he said, I made dua. Obviously, he did, he, did, he did a prayer. He never believed in Allah. He never believed in no God. So he made the prayer saying, saying um, Oh Lord, if you really do exist, give me a life that's worth living. Actually, a few weeks later, he caught a case. Now he's doing life in jail. He's in jail now saying, I don't know what the hell is going on, Akhi. I asked the Lord if he exists to give me a better life, a life of purpose. He gave me life in jail. Four years into his sentence, he got a dream. He's never spoken to a Muslim. Look at this, you're hearing this, Akhiya. You see, guidance doesn't come from you. I said this before and I'm gonna say this again. Guidance does not come from none of us here. And none of us in this dunya, apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This man has never spoken to a Muslim. He's never ever gone into a mosque. He's never been around a Muslim. None of his friends, his friend has ever been a Muslim. A Jamaican uncle, yeah? Four years into his sentence, he got a dream. And in his dream, he took his shahada. So he woke up thinking, whoa, 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 what's this? So he started asking people on his prison, Akhi, this is the situation, this is how my dream was. What could this be? Some people don't have the answer, some people don't have the answer. What did he do? He went to the priest, the priest doesn't have an answer. He went to the imam, imam says, this is in your dream, what it describes that you became a Muslim. He said, Muslim, what's that? So the Imam gave him books. The Imam gave him things to, 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 to read on. And then he had another dream that he took his shahada again. He said, this is written for me, man. A Jamaican uncle that's done 19 years in Joak, he's never been to a masjid. I'm waiting, to him, I'm waiting for him to be released in a few years, inshallah. And I said to see him, <coughs> I said to him, it's a promise that you have to give me, that I'm gonna be the first person to take you into a masjid. And the way we're gonna celebrate the day he comes out, akhi, is gonna be like Eid, inshallah wa ta'ala. 
Never seen a masjid. He took his shahad, akhi. And this same uncle, this Jamaican uncle, by the age of 58 or 57, he taught himself how to read the Quran. He taught himself how to memorize the Quran. And he taught himself the principles and the etiquettes and the manners. And no one else did, bro. And he did all of that in prison where we had the freedom we have out on road. You got the Imam that have the rules here. But man, them don't want to turn up. They only want to turn up to Juma. And I'm not downplaying Juma, bro. Alhamdulillah, you're coming for Juma. But out of 35 salah, you only come for one. Come on, Ak. At least pray one, one salah in the masjid. One salah in the masjid. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him. And I'm going to finish up on this, inshallah. As you lot know, and I'm going to say this regarding the charity, as you know, Allahumma barik, the masjid here is collecting money, Allahumma barik, where I think every single one of us should dig into our pockets. One lahi, the masjid hasn't mentioned, hasn't told me to mention this. I'm telling you, I'm my own good. Yeah, I want you guys to put into this masjid. This is a good masjid, inshallah. This is a masjid of, of, of brotherhood, of love, of compassion, of respect, of care for one another. Alhamdulillah, the brothers that I'm here with as well, you know, one ummah, your community, or one kid, oh, I think I've got a mixture. Yeah, they themselves are doing amazing things in, in, in Southampton. What are they doing? They're doing hiking. I'm going to go with them to hike into Mount Snowden on the 2nd of September to the 4th. <coughs> We're going to go. They got a football tournament, so if brothers here, inshallah, the imam could kick football, yeah? Make your own team, Sheikh, inshallah. We do a tour of table tennis. Sheikh, I'm from the jail day, Sheikh. I'm going to put you in your place, inshallah, out of respect. Yeah? Don't come to me with no table tennis talk, Sheikh. Yeah, you have one here, yeah? Talk is cheap, you know, Sheikh. Say no more. Say no more. Yeah, man. This is when I become, you know, passionate, Akhi. This is when I don't care about the opposition, yeah? Don't worry, I got you, Habib. But alhamdulillah, the masajid are doing good things. But it's time for you not to change, man. We want you to be the leaders of the future ummah, insha'Allah wa ta'ala. Because guess what? The train is pulling up, and I say this a lot. The train is pulling up where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to revive the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And ask yourself this. Are you going to be on that platform? You know, are you going to be on that platform when that train stops in order for him to continue to, you know, to get to his destination? If the answer is no, bro, today is your day to start. Today is your day to become a better servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today is the day where you start to be more obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today is the day where you follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today is the day where you be obedient to your parents, your mother, your mother, your mother, and then your father as the hadith states. Wallahi, remember that time is ticking. If there's 14 and 15 year olds that are dying, What, what? It doesn't make sense that we're living like we have the whole life waiting for us. Do you know, I did the calculation. If someone lives up to 75 years, 75 years, yeah? On average, if you take away <coughs> about... If you take away the sleeping, on average, you're living about 19... 19,223... 24 days If you live on average to 75 years akhi, You only have 19,224 days to live Remember that akhi. time is ticking akhi. What are you doing with your days akhi? I love you all for the sake of Allah I appreciate the masjid for inviting me May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This is definitely not going to be my last visit Especially when I know some Kurdish people are in here I'm here, I'm here to make, I'm here to set you guys straight, inshallah, Shaykh. Inshallah wa ta'ala. I remember as Abu Sufyan mentioned and the, and the Sheikh mentioned, akhi, your mental health is very important, akhi. But I'm going to leave you with one ayah, inshallah wa ta'ala, because this is an ayah that my mother taught me. And the ayah is, akhi, this is something that my mother used to recite a lot. It's from Surah Al Yusuf, my favorite surah. My mother used to say, no matter what trials and tribulations, and bear in mind, my mother gave birth to 14 kids, and she had to bury seven. 
So I've lost seven of my siblings. Allahumma ameen. Fourteen kids. So every single son be in prison. So every single son get stabbed up. And you know what happened? She became patient. She became patient. She became patient. And there was one ayah she kept on repeating. And this is something I will continue to say, inshallah. And the ayah is from Surah Yusuf, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. قَالَ إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ No matter what you're going through at home, or at work, or at school, whatever it may be, أخي, understand you should continue, continue, and continue to, re to recite these ayah. And this ayah means, I only complain of my grief and my worries to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.